Beloved, today is a wonderful day. Amen. And I'm truly excited about it. Reunion saying it, we got to get excited because something is happening in the church today. Today we begin Advent, which means that it is a new year. In the secular calendar, I know that January the 1st is the start of the year, but according to the Christian calendar, today is day one. So I say to one and to all, Happy New Year. And with the new year, there is for us new hope. I believe that this is critically important because as Christians, we get a jump start on the new beginnings that a new year brings. Yes, we get a head start. We hit reset a little bit early. If life was a film, a movie, or a drama, you might think about it this way. We get a sneak peek, an advanced preview of what is to come. We get out front, not because we are better than others, but rather because we are called to lead in making this world a better place. When we say and focus on Advent in the world, we are called to make what happens in here manifest out there. And one way we do this is by uh, focusing on the way we approach things, the way we approach life itself, Christian time, and the church seasons, therefore, are significant. Here's why. Here's why. High holy days and high holy seasons like Advent are important because we take these holidays, we take these seasons, we take these special and happy moments, and we make them not just isolated events, but rather we make them frequent occurrences. Think about it this way. We celebrate Thanksgiving Day, and still we live like every day is a day of Thanksgiving. We practice gratitude at all times, in season and out of season. We practice gratitude all times, from the rising of the sun to the very setting of the same, because the name of the Lord is to be praised. We practice gratitude all the time. Why? Because God is good. And all the time, through sickness and sleepless nights, we proclaim that God is good. Through hardships and through hunger, we proclaim that God is good. Through pain and persecution, we know that God is good. So we take these holidays. Last week, we celebrated Christ the King Sunday. Today, we begin Advent, and Advent gives way to Christmas, and Christmas gives way to the Epiphany, and the Epiphany gives way to Lent, and Lent gives way to Easter, and Easter gives way to Pentecost. We take these special days and we stretch them. We stretch these joyful days so that each and every day that we have breath in our lungs is a day full of joy. We practice gratitude. Christians take moments in time and stretch them so these joyful moments are not just single, isolated, individual moments in time, but rather it becomes for us this everyday practice of gratitude. It becomes for us the springboard, the launch pad, for us to face adversity and challenges and difficulties when they mount up in our lives. Uh, because fundamentally, as Christians, we live life differently. We view life differently, and then as, as a result of how we view life, we live life differently, always with a sense of gratitude, even when we're going through difficult moments. Think about it this way. It is written that we grieve we do not grieve loss as those without hope. We do not worry as people without faith. And we do not struggle as those without love. Because in our DNA, we are called always to hope. We are called always to keep the faith and to love even despite the world's lovelessness. So yes, it's the first Sunday of Advent. It is for us a fresh start. It is for us a new beginning because there is new hope. It's a season of light, beloved. The Advent candles which we light give way to the Christmas lights. Tomorrow in the Jewish tradition, Hanukkah begins. The day after Christmas in the black 
tradition, Kwanzaa begins, a season, extended season of light. So today, I invite you to think with me about the meaning of this season of light. In particular, I'm interested in how we view the darkness. In the midst of seasons of light, how do we view the darkness? How do we encounter those dark moments of the soul? The point is this. I believe that the coming of Christ Jesus as the light of the world transforms our very attitude about the light and even transforms our attitude about the darkness. The coming of Christ into the world as the light of the world changes, transforms the very way we think about light and darkness itself. Because it is written by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that we are not conformed to this world, but we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. So we are transforming how we think even about light and dark. Why? So you see, from an early age, from an early age, we are taught to think in binaries. Taught to think in binaries. Yes and no, good and bad, right and wrong, hot and cold, male and female, up and down, left and right, inside and outside, big and small, black and white, light and darkness. Now, to some degree, this makes complete and total sense because as human beings, we view the world based on who we are and how we show up in the world. So as human beings, generally speaking with two hands, we see and then we think often in twos and binaries. On the one hand, this. On the other hand, that. Now stay with me, I'm going somewhere with this. Now on the surface, there is nothing intrinsically problematic about seeing things in twos. But here's the rub. Over the course of human history, this two-ness has come to mean that often one is on the top and one is on the bottom. So in a world of big and small, bigger is better and smaller is worse. Right. In a world of rich and poor, if, the rich, if being rich is glamorous and the ideal, then as a result, being poor is shameful. In a world of black and white, if white is right, then black is wrong. And if the light is good, then the dark is bad. I love Star Wars. And during this season of Advent, I'm particularly partial to episode four, A New Hope. But there's a way in which Star Wars has uh, propped up this duality of, of light versus dark and good versus bad in our social imagination. Because, you know, in Star Wars, evil is the dark side. Darth Vader, the archetypal evil villain, is dressed in black while the heroes, including Princess Leia, don white. Now, to be sure, I'm not blaming George Lucas, but I will observe the unfortunate coincidence that he depicted on the silver screen what has always already been in our social imagination. So what's the point? Glad you ask. Here it is. The fear of the dark leads to a condemnation of black people of dark people, a condemnation of blackness. The fear of the dark, in fact, leads to a criminalization of black and brown bodies. And it often materializes too often in this way. For far too many police officers to see a black man means that there is already an imminent threat. So you, you're entitled then to shoot first and ask questions later. We, we saw it played out again and again when a Mantic Fitzgerald Bradford in, in Hoover, Alabama, uh, he, he was shot down, mistaken as the gun, uh, a gunman, when in fact he was a licensed gun holder. 
but before he could even present his license, he was shot down in cold blood. And, and then just recently in Chicago, a security guard who actually, Jamel Roberson, who actually helped to subdue a violent gunman was him, a security guard. Licensed and authorized was shot down because of how he showed up in the world as a black man. So, so it, doesn't, it doesn't even matter, you can do, do everything right and you're still wrong. Because in this, in, according to this logic, black bodies are automatically, intrinsically seen as villains even when they're the heroes, even when innocent. The murders of Amantic and Jamel come on top of a very, very long pattern of killing unarmed black men in recent years. So as we proclaim that black lives matter, we find ourselves in a really, really troubling time. It is a peculiar time to be alive because too often when you are black and have this dark skin, you are more easily killed. And then when we look around, we see how it carries over in other instances. Asylum seekers in Tijuana, Mexico, standing on the border at San Diego are already deemed criminals and condemned even before they arrive. Right, this language of illegal immigrants and illegal aliens, it is dangerous. Because when you demonize and dehumanize someone, it becomes that much easier to destroy and discard them. We learn this from Nazi Germany. When you start calling someone dogs, you can easily begin treating them like one. Yep. Our words and our speech and our actions are connected and, in fact, inextricably linked. So how do we change this? Of course, we need an overhaul of policing and criminal justice system and immigration policy and public policy in general. But I, I, I submit to you, it also requires something else, something deeper, that as a society, we must begin changing how we think that there must be an overhaul of systems of thought and our patterns of thinking. We need something more. We need something bolder. We need something more ambitious. It's such that, that in the midst of all this chaos, everything changes. We, we need a conversion that comes through, I believe, the incarnation. So Advent, bringing Advent into the world means that everything changes. Everything changes. When Christ comes into our life, uh, something in our life should change. Amen? Uh, the way we talk should change. When Christ comes into our life, the way we walk should change. When Christ comes into our life, the way we act should change. So conversion is a turning, a change of behavior that comes to us through the power of the incarnation. That, that God comes to dwell among us. And unless everything changes, we short circuit the power of the incarnation. We short circuit the power of what happens when God decides to be with us in human flesh, fully human and fully divine. That the one who is not of the world comes into the world in order to transform the world because God so loved the world. And something happens. Jesus changes everything. So yes, in view of Christ, everything changes, including the way we think. And even the relationship between light and darkness itself. So what if the light is good and the darkness is too? The great African-American theologian Howard Thurman describes it as a luminous darkness, a luminous darkness. And for us who are called to follow the one who is light, what is required of us is a radical rethinking of how Jesus even is the light of the world. That the light does not cast out the darkness, 
but rather illuminates it. Doesn't cast out the darkness, but rather illuminates it. We are not to be afraid of the dark, but rather to revel in its beauty. This is why the psalmist wrote in the 139th Psalm, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is upon my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it, says the the psalmist. Where can I go from your spirit? If I go to the highest of heavens, God, you are there. If I make my my bed in the deepest of places in Sheol, you are there. If I take upon the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, you are there. And even your hand, it shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. Surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light around me become night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. And the night is as bright as the day, for the darkness is as light to you. I believe, beloved, that this is good news for we who are dark. That this changing of our mindset and moving beyond binaries not only changes how we view the world, but it changes how we view ourselves when we face challenges and circumstances in the world. That, that, that we might, because of this changing of our mind, might be able to show up and approach adversity when it comes our way. Yes, light and darkness coexist. The night comes and the day too. It's not either the light or the darkness, but light and darkness. Because as surely as the sun rises, it also sets. So we dwell in darkness because darkness is not something to be feared. Because God comes in with us. Emmanuel, the God who is with us. And it gives to us the very mindset of Christ, which works this way. That I'm happy even when I'm sad. I'm healthy even when I'm sick. I'm strong even when I'm weak. I'm rich even when I'm poor. I'm comforted even amidst affliction. Paul says it this way, uh, but we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that the extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. So get this, we are afflicted in every way, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but we are not forsaken. We may be struck down, but guess what? We are not destroyed, beloved. So so, so the word for us today is just to keep on standing. Even when you want to sit down, keep standing. Keep on standing when you want to give up, just keep standing. When you want to throw in the towel, keep standing. Even when your back is against the wall, keep standing because God is with us. So keep standing for the immigrant on the border because we must remember that Jesus was an immigrant. So keep standing with women and and marginalized people. Keep standing with LGBTQI people because black lives matter and queer lives matter and keep standing with the poor, even the poor in spirit. The incarnation, it is for us a radical reorientation of our entire world view that the God of the in-between is always with us when we find ourselves both betwixt and between. So when we go through it, in order to get to it, God is going with us. Amen. Amen.